faces that I love and pray for and have missed, and great to see all of you here on this first Sunday of the new year. It seems like the new year should be like about February now, and it's just the first first Sunday. I have a number of announcements uh, and a pretty full service today. Uh, the first one is, if you haven't uh, picked up your Bible reading plan, it is not too late to start. To catch up, I talked to somebody on Friday that hadn't started, and they got caught up by Saturday. And so those are out there on the table in the fellowship hall if you want to pick that up. Uh, the deacons are meeting next Sunday um, as our normal second Sunday meeting. And so uh, for the old and new deacons, I will throw that out that we'll be meeting next Sunday. Um, tonight is uh, we begin our Bible study uh, again, uh, reading through Scripture. Uh, if you're interested in that and you haven't come, come tonight and just kind of get a sense of what that's like. Uh, we meet at 5.30 in the Fellowship Hall, and we would love to greet you, uh, to greet you then. Uh, next Sunday, uh, Roger is starting a new Sunday School series. And uh, so come for that if you can come to Sunday school. Sunday school is a great time of fellowship and learning and, um, and singing together. And so uh, make the effort to get up and be here for, for that if you can. Also, Tuesday night, uh, we start Grief Share. And so if, if uh, I've asked the elders to be a part of that this year, if they can, and uh, it will meet at 6.30 on Tuesday nights for about an hour. If, if you know somebody who is struggling with, with grief or has recently lost someone or maybe lost someone 10 years ago but hasn't really moved beyond it as happens so very often, I would encourage you uh, to make this a part of your uh, Tuesday night routine for a few weeks. It is a magnificent program. I have heard testimony and testimony and testimony from people who have attended it. Some have attended it twice, uh, and um, that starts Tuesday night at, uh, at 6.30. And of course, immediately after our service today, for those of you who are members, we will have a congregational meeting uh, for the stated purpose of uh, approving our 2024 budget and electing John Sparks to the office of Elder Emeritus. I believe that's all the announcements I have uh, for us. Let's uh, call ourselves to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. That's here today. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray together. Father, we do ask as we come this morning in humble worship that we might experience the glory of your presence here, that we might praise you from whom all blessings flow. And Father, we ask now that you would shine your kindly light upon our service, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Good morning. If you will stand with me and take your hymnal and pay, turn to page 63, All Preachers of Our God and King, and we will sing verses 1, 2, and 5.
stand as we confess our sins before a holy God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed the too, too much the desires and devices of our own heart. We have offended against your holy law. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done and have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no help in us. But you, O oh Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders as we are. Spare those, O oh God, who confess their faults. Restore those who are repentant. According to your promises, declare to mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O oh most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, all to the glory of your name. For we ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. <laughs> seated. Miss my buddy Seth like my candles. I don't right there AP right next to you. Um, we are about to do something that is sacred in our church uh, and that is to install and ordain uh, some new officers. So I'm going to call the session down now if they would to come and stand with me on this side over here and if you're a serving elder or have served previously come and join us uh, and join us here congregation plays an important role in this service uh, this morning, we are ordaining and installing Klaus Vischer, and I'm going to ask him if he'll come up now, and we are reinstalling Wynn Scott, I'm going to ask him if he will come up now as well, and just stand uh, right over here to, uh, to my left. No dancing in the sanctuary. The office of deacon is an important office. They are charged with the welfare of our congregation, particularly uh, the needy in our congregation. They are to uh, seek to make sure that um, uh, our congregation is a giving con congregation. They oversee the building uh, and grounds as well. And so it is an important office. And so we are delighted uh, to have these two men come today. Uh, Klaus, the first several questions are addressed to you as uh, one who is being ordained for the first time into the office of deacon. Do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and do you confess anew the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and acknowledge him head over all things for the church, which is his own body. Do you? Do you affirm your belief in the Bible, the scriptures of the Old and New Testament, as the living word, as the word of the living God, the only perfect rule of faith and practice, infallible in all that it teaches, and inerrant in its original manuscripts, from which nothing is to be added and which, from which nothing is to be taken at any time or upon any pretext, do you? Yes. 
Do you accept the doctrines of this church contained in the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms as founding on, founded on the Word of God and as the expression of your own faith, and do you resolve to adhere thereto? Do you accept the government, discipline, and worship of the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church? And so these last three questions will be to you both. Do you accept the office of deacon in this congregation, and do you promise to perform faithfully all the duties of the office, and do you promise to endeavor by the grace of God to live your life in Christian witness before the church and in the world, do you? Do you promise to submit in the spirit of love to the authority of the session and to the higher courts of the church, do you? Do you promise in all things to promote the unity, peace, purity, and prosperity of the church? The last question is to all of you, the <coughs> members of our congregation. Do you, the members of the congregation, acknowledge and receive these fellow members as deacons? And do you promise to give them all the honor and encouragement and assistance in the spirit of love to which their office, according to the word of God and the standard of this church, entitles them. If you do, please say, I do. I do. Thank you. I'm going to ask you two to kneel now. If you guys would come up and place your hands on these two brothers. Let's pray together. Father God, we pray now that you would set apart from a uh, simple member to an office of deacon, these two men. We pray for Wynn and Klaus as they endeavor to serve the people of this church, that they take on this servant role in humility and in the grace of Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that we as a church would give them that honor and uh, encouragement in the days ahead. Bless them, O Lord. May they fulfill all their responsibilities with diligence and with grace and in mercy. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can get up now if you can. Now, before we, before we start down that road, let me make a benediction for y'all. Now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the great head of the church, I now declare you duly ordained and installed in the sacred office of deacon. And we will then all give you the right hand of fellowship. I would encourage all of you to congratulate <coughs> and con to continue to encourage uh, these men as they carry out their duties. The little tab in your bulletin is our January mem memory verse, and we'll read it all together now. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Our Old Testament reading this morning is taken from Genesis 1, and I'll be reading 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the faces of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God said, The light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. 
Our next hymn this morning is on page 34, He is Lord. If you will stand with me once more, please. New Testament reading this morning comes from Mark 1, and I'll be reading 4 through 9, through 8, excuse me. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And he went, when he came upon the water, he immediately saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you, I am well pleased. AP, as we come to our prayer time this morning, uh, one person I would add, uh, Brenda Oakley. Brenda Oakley, uh, we'll add her next week. Um, that is uh, Jerry Taylor's mother-in-law. Uh, she's in our hospital here, um, and we need to be in prayer uh, for her. You should have all received a January prayer card, and uh, so we would ask that you would be praying for those things in your time of private prayer or family worship, uh, and we will certainly be praying those as well. Let's go to the Lord. O oh, gracious God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, mighty is your name, for you have conquered death and the curse of death you are the creator and the sustainer of all that there is and so oh Lord we lift before your thrones our petitions this morning Lord, Lord we would pray for those who are listed here in our bulletins that need our continued watch care and prayer we're thankful that Becky Jones is now home, and we ask for your continued healing. We pray for Brenda Oakley as well. Uh, we're so thankful that 
You are a God who cares about the details of our lives. Father, we praise you uh, for Jeff Partridge finishing up his treatments here. Uh, and Lord, we would lift before you uh, Woody Jones, who goes this week for a procedure. Lord, there are others here that need your prayer and watch care over them. We're thankful for your grace upon grace. Be with our homebound as well, O oh Lord. Lift them and hold them and encourage them. Father, we pray for our church as we begin a new year. We pray for grief share as we offer that ministry to those who are hurting. We pray for our Bible reading program that people would feel the need to take up the book and read. Even as your call to the great Saint Augustine was to pick up and read, so our call would be to all of our congregation and those in our community, pick up and read. The glory of God. We do pray for our Bible study as well. We pray for our congregational meeting today. Father, we ask that you would be with all of our missions that we support through our faith promise pledges. We particularly this month pray for RUF and for uh, John Gordy at Valdosta State University that more and more students would come to know the gospel through his ministry there. Father, we pray that you would raise up leaders across all levels of our government who would honor and trust you. We pray for the Holy Spirit to give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand your word in the days ahead. And Father, we would pray for the church in Nigeria, even as over a hundred were murdered on Christmas Eve there, Christians were murdered, and some 52,000 Christians killed in the last 14 years there, Lord. We would pray that you would not only pour out your grace to those in the church in this this country but father we would pray that those of us around the world would take note of the gross savagery that evil wreaks on your church there and we would pray father that we would be men and women not only who are praying about it but encouraging our government to do something about it lord lead us in all that we do Give us a sense of your presence, for we ask it all in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. As our ushers come forward, I would remind us all that we are starting a new year, but that we need to be generous in our givings to the Lord.
grant that we would be good stewards of those gifts that you have so freely given to all of us. May we give freely and out of the joy that it brings to us as we support your ministry here, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. If you'll be turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, I'm going to be there in just a couple of minutes. Let me digress for just a moment and say that I had not realized, as was the topic of uh, much of my prayer, about what was going on in the church in Nigeria. Uh, Christians there being killed by, for sport. Uh, Greg was kind enough to mention that to me today, and I thank you for that. Uh, and he said something to me that I could not believe. And I know for a fact that Revelation says that Christ will not come until those uh, who are to be killed for their faith, that number, that specific number that God has in the wise counsel of his will is reached. But I did not know that 52,000 Christians had been killed in the last 14 years there, over 100 on Christmas Eve. Then Greg told me something else, and I didn't believe him, sorry. So I went and looked it up, and the major media outlets are blaming climate change for the murder, rape, and pillage of all of these Christians. They say the herdsmen in, the Muslim herdsmen have to kill the Christians so they can find better land for their own herds in Nigeria. Nigeria is a huge country, by the way. If you don't know, its, long, its coast is longer than the entire east coast of the United States. It's one of the largest countries in Africa. So pray for the church there. Those who stay behind and minister. Those who have nowhere else to go. And so they subject themselves daily to the threat of rape and murder and maiming by machetes, to be honest with you. And so we want to pray for that church continually, and we're certainly going to add it to our prayer list here. We have prayed for the church in Ukraine in the past days, and we're going to begin to steadily pray for the church in Nigeria. Today we bring to a close our series on forgiveness. Uh, I entitled the whole series, The Blessing of Forgiveness, and, or The Advent of Forgiveness, and today we're going to talk about the blessing that come to you and come to me as we forgive others. There were, frankly, two goals in my mind as I thought about this back in the fall. Uh, what to preach during Advent. One of the goals was to help us to better understand what happens at Advent in terms of forgiveness. That the one who comes and is born in the manger comes to die for the forgiveness of our sins. That when cross pays, Christ pays the penalty for our, our sins on the cross, it is a complete total forgiveness. <clears throat> when you came to faith in Jesus Christ, you were as forgiven as you will ever be, perfectly. And you received at that same moment the righteousness of Christ credited to your account so that the credit of your sins went to Christ and the credit of Christ's righteousness went to you. That was the first and foremost goal, for us to all have a better sense of what Christ does for us, beginning at Advent. The second goal, as I thought about where we needed to go with all of this, was 
that we would become more forgiving of each other and of ourselves, that we talked about there the necessity of forgiveness, that Christ calls us, because of his great work on the cross, he calls us to openly, freely, and totally forgive other people when they sin against us, particularly other believers. And to withhold that forgiveness from another Christian is to sin grossly in your own life. Whether that person has come to you and asked for it or not. Now, this final message, we're going to be, as I said, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And I hope that we'll see some of the blessings that come to us as we receive our forgiveness and then as we forgive others. I want to give you a little bit of background before I read this passage. We find here the Apostle Paul writing perhaps his fourth letter. It's called 2 Corinthians. We don't have, I don't think, the first letter. And I think there was a third letter. We have what we call 1 and 2 Corinthians, which many believe were, I think, the second and the fourth letter sent to that church. But we have Paul writing to the church there speaking about a particular man who has sinned and has repented and is ready for restoration. Some believe that this man was the one who was referred to actually in 1 Corinthians as the man who was living in incest with his father's wife. Others believed that this man was someone who publicly ridiculed the Apostle Paul. And in publicly doing that, questioned God's authority as given to this great Apostle. Well, whatever and whomever Paul is writing about here, whatever the exact situation Paul is telling the church at Corinth, look, I told you to discipline this man and you've disciplined him. He has repented. It is now time to restore him. Remember, my dear friends, that, and we talk about this in the session all the time, the goal is, of church discipline is always restoration. It is never ultimately condemnation. It is always to restore that person back into fellowship. Repentance is genuine, then restoration is necessary. But evidently this man has been has repented publicly from his sin and now the church is ready to restore him. They had forgiven him, and they, they were not to exact any more punishment from him. They were not to look for more revenge, but they were now to love him. Titus had reported all this to Paul, and Paul now calls on the church to restore him. So let's stand together. We briefly look at this passage in 2 Corinthians 5. We stand in honor of God's Word, for we believe and we teach that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, inerrant in all that it claims. Hear the Word of the Lord. Now if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the, by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be so he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I beg you to reaffirm your love for him, for this is why I wrote you, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. 
Indeed, what have I forgiven if I have forgiven anything has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Father, we pray that you would bless the reading and the hearing of this, your word, but may we see no man save Christ alone, for it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Be seated. I'm sorry to say I'm going to go pretty rapidly this morning. That may be a joy to some of you that I'm going rapidly. Uh, but we do have communion this morning. I find seven blessings that we are to receive out of this passage. And I hope that you will see them there as well. The first one is that forgiveness deflects pride. Forgiveness deflects pride. Paul demands no personal apology before the church forgives and restores this man. Oftentimes, pride is what keeps us from forgiving somebody else. But Paul wants us to minimize the hurt that we feel and to offer forgiveness. He refuses. Here's the beauty of what Paul does. He refuses to take it personally. Now that's hard to do sometimes. Someone offends us, makes accusations to us and at us, to not take it personally. By forgiving him, this man, and calling on the church to do that same thing, Paul gives no room in his own heart for pride. It gives no room for that vengeance to take seed. It makes it, doesn't it, much easier for the church to forgive this man, because Paul has already, the one who is offended, has already forgiven him. And so the church, as they read this letter, says, well, Paul's forgiven this guy. How can we not do that as well? Paul, <laughs> we live in a society that hates what I'm about to say. But Paul refuses to be a victim. Paul refuses to to be a victim. As someone once said, a wounded ego cannot, that cannot rise above a personal offense is the opposite of Christ's likeness. 1 Corinthians, in his first letter, Paul writes in that most famous 13th chapter, right, love makes no record of offense. That means that if you truly love someone, you can't say to them, well, I remember when you did such and such. Forgiveness frees us from the chain of self-pity or the chain of pride. The second thing I see here comes to us in verse 6. And that is that forgiveness shows mercy. Remember, mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting something. I think I said that right. Mercy is not getting uh, what you deserve. And so when we forgive, we show mercy. Verse 6 says, For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. Right? You've done what you needed to do. The punishment done by the church was effective. And so it's time to move on. God is merciful to us, and we are to be merciful to one another. 
Number three. Forgiveness restores joy. We could look at Psalm 51 if we had time to this morning. But God delights in the repentant sinner. Isaiah 42, verse 3, says this. A bruised reed he will not break, <clears throat> and a faintly burning wick he will not snuff out. God delights in the repentant sinner. Here, verse 7 says, So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him. Right? Hebrews 12 combines repentance and restoration and comfort there together. God has no limit to his mercy to us and Neither should we to the repentant sinner. An unforgiving heart leaves no room for joy. How can I be joyful and hold a grudge? <clears throat> I once read that the person that has the most influence over you is the one against whom you hold a grudge. Think about that. Number four, forgiveness affirms love. Right, so I beg you to affirm your love for him. We are to show mercy so that the person doesn't become overwhelmed with sorrow. We are to show love so that we can show the joy of Christ. To withhold forgiveness is to withhold Love, which we are commanded to love one another. The idea here of reaffirming, verse 8, so I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. This idea of reaffirming is a public idea. That he has publicly repented and so publicly they need to show their love to this guy. Their restoration. To this guy. A forgiving church family that deals with the issues and moves on, that kind of church is almost impossible to fracture. Where fractures happen is when people can't offer love and forgiveness. When somebody has a different opinion or whatever it might be. Like the prodigal son's father, we are to celebrate repentance and restoration. Fifthly, forgiveness proves obedience. Right? Paul, verse 9. For this is why I wrote that I might test you. He's talking to the church. He's testing the church to know whether they're going to be obedient in everything he has called them to do. We show obedience to the Father when we forgive other people and restore them when they've re repented. When we refuse to hold a grudge, when we offer freely repentance no matter what, we're showing our obedience to the Heavenly Father. We are acting most Christ-like when we have forgiving hearts that long for restoration. This is Matthew 6, right? Forgive others. True fellowship happens when we have no secret resentments or grudges. Forgiveness frees all parties to fellowship together in joy. What a great, great blessing that is. And lastly, forgiveness thwarts the work of Satan. Verse 11. By restoring this man, they would outwit Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Satan's agenda is to thwart forgiveness. 
to keep reminding you that you need to hold a grudge, that you can't forgive that other person because they've hurt you so bad. That's the work of Satan. It keeps the grounds of our heart fertile for discontentment when we harbor an unforgiving spirit. We are truly blessed when we live out forgiveness, when we live as forgiven people. My dear friends, God has forgiven you immeasurably for your sins. We are called to forgive others and to live in the blessing that comes to us as forgiven sinners and the blessing and the joy that comes as we fellowship together because we hold no grudges, we hold no resentment, we hold nothing back but love for our fellow man. So may we live in the joy of repentance and restoration that we all have honestly received as we move forward in our obedience to Christ. Amen. Father, as we come now to your table that celebrates our forgiveness, may we live in the joy of repentance so that we might know the fellowship that you would call us to. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to the table, and we'll do the table this year, I hope, on the first Sunday of, of most months of the year, I invite you to come, not because this is the table of Louisville Presbyterian Church, but because this is the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said that we are to do this in memory of him. And that one who memory we are celebrating is the one who is leading us in forgiveness, showing us the path of forgiveness of other people. And so I invite you to come. If you are not right with God this morning, I would simply ask that you let the cup and the bread pass. But if you have come prepared to meet Jesus here and to enjoy the fellowship and the joy of your own forgiveness and the forgiving of others, then come and partake of this meal together. We're passing today because of the amount of flu and sickness that's going around everywhere. And so um, I'm going to invite the elders to come down uh, now and they'll pass uh, to, to you as we go. We'll eat together, so take the bread and hold it till we finish, and then we'll drink the cup uh, together. So I'll ask those elders to come on down now that are going to participate in our service. Let's pray together. Father God, separate now from a common to a sacred use so much as may be used of this as we eat this meal that you have commanded us to eat. For we ask it in Jesus' name. The words of the institution of our Lord Jesus Christ come to us from the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord that which I pass on to you, that the Lord... Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death till he comes again. Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, 
took bread and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, God so loves us, we also ought to love one another. This is his body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of him. <coughs> the same way after the supper, he took the cup saying this cup is the blood of the new covenant in me drink ye all of it for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you do proclaim the Lord's death till he returns Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not take, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human Form, he humbled himself and became be obedient even to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father.
is the blood of the new covenant. Drink ye all of it in remembrance of him. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for the richness of your mercy to us. We do thank you for this meal which strengthens our body, encourages our soul, draws us into a closer walk with you. May we leave this place better than we came, for we have been with Jesus. For we ask it in his name. Amen. We read that when they had finished, they sang a song. And so uh, because we have a congregational meeting immediately afterwards, let's turn in the back of your hymn book and we will sing the first verse and the chorus <coughs> of the song of thanksgiving. Let's stand together. <laughs> benediction any of you who are visiting with us are free to stay or free to go and uh, if you members will stay we'll turn AP Jones our congregational chairman will lead our meeting this morning receive now the benediction may the grace of Jesus Christ the love of God the Father and the fellowship that comes with the Holy Spirit be with you all Till he returns. Amen. Welcome again. Uh, I call this meeting to order and I'll ask Elder Johnny Gordy to pray. Thank you, Johnny. The stated purpose of our meeting today is to approve the 2020 budget and to elect John Sparks to the office of Elder Americus. <coughs> Emeritus. Is there a motion from the session? So moved. Uh, I see Ricky stepped out for a second. So, uh, Mike Kofer, would you read? Oh, there he is. Elder Sapp, would you read uh, read the business?
Thank you, Rick. Is there a second to this motion? No. Is there any discussion of the motion on the budget? We have our treasurer. Thank you for being here today to answer any questions that uh, you may have. Is the uh, Is the congregation ready to vote? Looks like we are. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. And now we will review the budget as Elder Sapp passes it out. Sorry for that delay. It's a good way of getting it passed before we review it, though, isn't it? <laughs> so look it over quickly. And if you have a question, uh, if I can't answer it, then I'll certainly pass it on to our esteemed treasurer, Madam Treasurer, as I like to call her. Any questions? I'd like to thank the Finance Committee, along with the help of our past Treasurer Walter, all the many years that he served us. Uh, he has been a godsend to Denise and the transition from one Treasurer to another. Thank you, Walter, for your service, and thank you, Denise. Any questions? Looks like there being none. Uh, Mr. Yes, go ahead. Okay, stand up. You recognize. Right. Jerry, would you and John like to comment on your? <laughs> okay. <laughs> if there's no other reason for the state of business, uh, I ask Mike Sanford to pray for us. Amen. Thank you for attending. We're adjourned. <laughs>